we're delighted to welcome top US astrologer, author, architect, graphic designer, and artist, Tad Mann. Tad is the author of 18 books on astrology and the sacred, including The Round Art, Lifetime Astrology, Astrology and the Art of Healing, and Sacred Landscapes, to name but a few. In the 1970s, Tad developed a process oriented uh, approach to the birth chart called Lifetime Astrology, which is inspired by the teachings on the nature of time by Armenian mystic George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, the Russian esotericist um, P.D. Uspensky, and the British spiritual development writer Rodney Collin. Tad has been much in demand as a lecturer and consultant astrologer for over four decades and has done over 5,000 readings based on his unique approach to astrology. Tad was born and currently lives in New York, but also spent many years living in England and Denmark. And on a personal note, I'm particularly thrilled to welcome Tad, um, or welcome him again, I should say, because Tad came uh, to see us in the 1990s. Um, I'm thrilled personally as his book, The Round Art, here is my battered, copy from 1979, is responsible for starting my own lifelong journey into astrology. Um, so thank you, Tad, and over to you. Thank you, Graham. And it's a pleasure to be with you. And I will share my screen now. This image, I, I, call, I call this talk Navigating Your Life Story because astrology is very interesting. I was self-taught because I was originally an architect. And so when I first came in contact to astrology, I began realizing something very unusual when I tried to start doing readings for people, which is I wasn't really sure how to organize the material that arose from an astrological interpretation, because it seemed to me there was no inherent time, timing in the chart itself. And I kept thinking that it was very peculiar that the houses were numbered from one to 12, as were the signs, and yet no one seemed to use them as a sequence of influences in a person's life. So I came across the work of Gurdjieff and Ospensky, as Graham mentioned, and I began realizing with Rodney Collins' book, The Theory of Celestial Influence, that there needed to be, for in my mind, a complete reevaluation of the way astrology functioned. So one of the ideas that's very important in astrology, as you well know, is the whole idea of as above, so below. This is a frontispiece from a book by Robert Flood. It's called The History of the Microcosm. And you can see the image here is actually very interesting because it shows a man astride a zodiac because you can see there's a sun and a moon on either side of his head and also a series of planetary rings and a series of elemental rings in the middle. And what's interesting is you can see that although there's an inner circle here, which the man is astride, it makes it seem as though that solar system is in him. Because around him, the second ring out is a sun and a moon and a series of planetary rings again and a series of elemental rings and then a, 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 a circle of fixed stars. So the idea here is very interesting because it implies that there's a zodiac outside of us as well as a zodiac inside of us. And the real key to me was this figure in the upper right, which is a putty, like a little angel with wings and you can see he's carrying a cord in his hand and it wraps around the microcosm which is the inner ring which is labeled microcosm the inner world and the macrocosm which is the outer ring which is the outer world and in some way this spiral cord links the inner world and the outer world together well i began realizing in my early work that that spiral cord is in fact the DNA molecule, which of course is in every single living cell. And, and I began tracking down 
thanks to Rodney Collins' book, the real orientation of that spiral inside and outside. So you can start by looking at the Milky Way galaxy, which you see in this image. And what's interesting about it is that our solar system and the sun is about a third of the way between the center of the galaxy and the periphery. And you can see also that this entire galaxy is spinning in a clockwise direction. So the idea is that our sun is not just sitting in space somewhere, but rather it's actually moving around the galactic center. What's bizarre to understand is that it actually, our sun actually revolves around the galactic center at close to 1 million miles every day, which is very close to the speed of light. So we're traveling so quickly that it's almost inconceivable. And the entire galaxy is also moving in the axis of this arrow that says our solar system is here. So it's not only moving around, but it's moving in a direction like the direction of the center of the galaxy itself. So I created a diagram, which is in the book, The Round Art, years and years and years ago, and you can see it's shown by this image at the top here, which is the sun moves around the galactic center, making a shaft of light, basically, in its path. And around the sun is a series of spirals, which represent the orbits of the planets. And you can see here, you know, it's not easy to see because this slide is a little bit vague, but within the center are the, the inner planets, which is Mercury, Venus, and Mars, and, and these shady areas on the outside are the, are the, the uh, asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and the planets of Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are all much longer spirals that contain this inner spiral path. Well, what's interesting is if you see the Earth, which is the third planet out, this diagram right here, in fact, shows 12 years of time because the Earth has moved 12, you can't see it, it's difficult to see, but it's a blue orbit that makes that spiraling pattern that happens along the whole length of the spiraling solar system. And each one of those spirals is one year of time. So a, a chart of a person is simply a slice through that spiraling pattern at a particular time and place at an angle based on where you are on the Earth at the moment of your birth. What's interesting about it, and I discovered this many, many years ago, is that if you draw this spiraling solar system, which is a very difficult image, even though I'm an architect, if you draw it from the Earth as the center instead of the sun, which is the way we see a chart, it represents a double spiral. And that double spiral is very similar in form to the DNA molecule, which you see here. This is one of the existing possible models of how the DNA molecule works. You can see it looks as though it's a time share of a whole series of planetary orbs spiraling around the sun. So the idea is that there's a similar pattern of the DNA molecule in every single living cell and the spiraling solar system in the macrocosm represents and parallels and exchanges information with the DNA molecule in every living cell. So within us, we li quite literally have a miniature solar system that is resonating with exchanging information with the spiraling solar system of our planet and the sun and the whole Milky Way galaxy. So this is really the basis of lifetime astrology. And the idea of it is also a very interesting one because if your chart is a slice through the spiraling pattern at the time of your birth, you can see that to the left, it moves towards the future. And it also moves in the back to the right into the past. And of course, as we know, our DNA doesn't begin with us, but rather your DNA is taken from your mother's DNA and your father's DNA and your grandparents' DNA and your great-grandparents' DNA and so on. So the interesting thing about genetics in this sense is that because we're alive at this very moment, we are the result 
of a 100% successful experiment in breeding because all of our ancestors survived long enough to produce offspring. Maybe we don't survive in that same way, but then the idea is that we carry within us not only projections into the future, which of course in astrology is predictive, but also it moves backwards into the past. So in my way of looking at things, it not only represents the influences that happen within your mother during the gestation process, but also you can extend it past that into actually what I consider to be previous incarnations, meaning that we carry all history within us. In fact, Carl Jung, the psychologist, called it the collective unconscious for that reason. That it's not personal to us, it's not about our own individual history, but it represents our individual history is tacked onto this collective history of all humanity. And we all carry this in every single cell in our body. So the idea is this is like a slightly larger model of that spiral of the DNA molecule. And there are many different forms of this image, but this particular one shows quite clearly how that spiraling process really works. You could say really that we are contained within, you know, our horoscope contains that DNA signature somehow in the planets. And this is the uh, opinion that I took on many, many years ago. It was the basis of my book, The Round Art. And basically it represents the basis of my s system of astrology as well. So the idea is there are a couple of dynamics that are interesting to know about. First of all, this idea of microcosm equals macrocosm. What's very interesting is you can see in the top image that a, a symbol or a diagram showing one neuron in our human brain is linked to all other neurons by a series of streams of information, which are shown as these red lines. If you look at the bottom, it also shows a cluster of galaxies. Our, our Milky Way galaxy is one of billions of galaxies. And all of these galaxies in the universe are linked together by energetic channels that in a very crazy way mirror the way the neurons in our brain are connected to each other. In fact, it's said that we have as many neurons in the human brain as there are galactic systems in the universe. So in a way, we're, con we're containing within us not only information about our own lives in space and time, but we all also have access to the entire rest of the universe. And I consider this to be a kind of in you know, unused or underused brain potential, which is very powerful. And in fact, when you use the system of lifetime astrology, as I call it, it basically allows you to have a kind of deeper and more profound access to these workings of the DNA molecule, the solar system, and our lives in time. You can see here also that our health is very much affected by the relationship between these molecules. In fact, these are the very early stages of cell development that happen in the womb. Meaning during the time of gestation, from the time you're conceived, when the sperm from your father meets the egg of your mother, it basically creates an ovum, which looks like this in the upper left, and that ovum begins a very complicated series of cell divisions, which gradually in the course of the, of the evolutionary process, during the nine months of our gestation, we go from being a fertilized ovum, a single celled being, to a, a fully developed human being child. So the idea is that gestation in a way is what's equivalent to what Jung called the collective unconscious, meaning this period of time from when you're conceived until you're born is incredibly significant. What's intriguing about astrology is that, of course, the gestation period is not often recognized or understood. The idea here is that if you look at this image on the right-hand side, which shows the solar system in a traditional form with Aries and the first house, Taurus and the second house, Gemini and the third, Cancer and the fourth, and so on. 
if you basically take that whole dynamic of the spiraling solar system, what occurs basically is that the chart, our human chart, is basically a circle of events. It's a cycle of a lifetime. So what's interesting about it is by common consent, the ascendant, which is zero Aries archetypally, is the birth moment. But it's also curious because the three signs, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, are often associated with childhood. And the planets Leo, Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio are often associated with our development throughout life because Scorpio, being the eighth sign in the eighth house, is the house of death and the sign of death, Scorpio. So the idea here, which is kind of interesting in a way, is that what we're doing is we're going from birth to death in two-thirds of the chart, but this other third from the ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th houses is not is somehow missing. In fact, in Rodney Collins' theory of celestial influence, and of course, as you probably all know, Joyce Collins Smith was a renowned British astrologer for many, many years until she passed away about 10 years ago or so. She was a great friend of mine. And through her, I heard all kinds of interesting stories and information about her brother-in-law, Rodney Collin. So the idea is that Collin basically said the missing octave in the chart is our gestation. Because the ninth cusp, which is the beginning of the sign Sagittarius, is very interesting because it represents, you know, if Scorpio is the end of life and the death process, the last years of our life, then Sagittarius is very interesting because it represents a new beginning. It's also about a transcendent process in some way. And so the whole idea is there's a transformation that happens at that death point. And in fact, I began to realize through Rodney Collin that it's not only the death point, but if you look at this as the gestation period from the ninth cusp to the ascendant, the ninth cusp is your conception point. So if you look at the ninth cusp in your chart, you can see the sign that the ninth cusp is in and any planets that are in that area of the chart, they represent your conceptual creativity. So I thought this was a very fascinating process because it parallels something on the left, which is called the wheel of samsara in Tibetan Buddhism. And you can see from from really from the beginning, like the ascendant on this side of the chart, all the way around this wheel, even though it's divided in six segments instead of 12, it's essentially the entire life process. In Buddhism, from conception, I mean, from birth, all the way back through the conception point and into death and a higher octave that they call a transcendent process. So the whole idea is if you look at the chart on the right, as being a pattern of your life in time, it becomes a very interesting dynamic because, in fact, if you know about our life and we do by living it, it is a process in time. So my way of doing astrology, lifetime astrology, is that I don't start at the birth moment because already many, many influences have come into being. It's a kind of myth in a way that we come into the world at birth as an empty canvas. Because I think we come into birth all kinds of, through all kinds of karmic influences that came into being during our gestation process when we were carried inside of our mother. So at the conception point of the cusp of the ninth house in your chart is when your father and mother made love to conceive you. The ninth house, interestingly enough, is the period of time from when your mother becomes pregnant to when she becomes aware of that fact at the midheaven, which is a period of approximately seven weeks, which is the archetypal time from when a woman becomes pregnant until she knows that she's pregnant and can be tested to be validated. So I thought this is very, very interesting because of essentially during the ninth house, that, that seven weeks after conception, we're basically a brain with a little vestigial skeletal system attached to it. And so it's not accidental the ninth house is seen as being the house of higher mind, of philosophy, psychology, religion, what you believe. 
It also indicates this idea of if, if the ninth house has higher mind than the traditional meaning of the third house, Gemini, is, is inner mind or personal mind. So the idea here is that there's a relationship by opposition from the houses in this particular system. So again, when your mother realizes she's pregnant, the midheaven in your chart describes the moment when your mother realizes that she's pregnant. If Mars is around the midheaven, it often means she goes to a doctor, maybe she thinks she's ill, and the doctor says, you're not ill, you're pregnant. So any planets that occur in the ninth house represent influences that affected your mother while she began realizing and coming into realization that she was pregnant. Because the ninth house also represents the idea of self-realization. The 10th house related to the sign Capricorn is, is an interesting time because the main development from seven weeks after conception at the midheaven to about 13 weeks, which is about four months or so, uh, three months or so at the cusp of the 11th house, the sign Capricorn, interesting, is an Earth sign, and that's the time during which most of our evol evolutionary development is creating our physical body. So the physical body of the sign Capricorn is very powerful. So in the same way that the symbol of, the, of Sagittarius is a centaur, which is a human's torso on an animal body, during the ninth house, we go through all of the pre-animalistic stages of evolution until we become fully human. And in Capricorn, we see the goat fish, which was we begin swimming around in the amniotic fluid within our mother, the fish-like part of us. But again, we have this whole idea of we have a physical body that becomes stronger and stronger and becomes more noticeable until they say at the cusp of the 11th house at about you know, 13 weeks after conception is around the time your mother becomes aware that she can feel you inside. It's, this, it's called the quickening. So the 11th house is when your mother, while she's carrying you, begins idealizing who and what the child she's carrying is going to be like. You know, until not too many years ago, it wasn't possible to know the gender of your child until birth. But of course, in recent years, you can also find a, a test that will actually check for gender beginning at around 13 weeks after conception. But the 11th house being about Aquarius and an air sign is very interesting. It's, its symbol in ancient times was to the symbol, instead of being water, it's two fish swimming in opposite directions, but in parallel to each other. So the idea is your mother's thoughts paralleled you as the developing mind in the ovum within her. So the whole idea is during the 11th house, your mother begins thinking and becomes aware of the fact that you're inside of her. And that's like a dual relationship that parallels each other, meaning your mother's relationship to you on a deeper level is indicated by the sign and planets in the, in the 11th house. The 12th house begins around 23 weeks after conception until 40 weeks, which is nine, nine months or eight, calendar, eight, eight lunar months. And so the idea here is that this begins around 23 weeks after conception. And the, and the Pisces sign, the 12th house, is the last stage of gestation during which, very much like the symbol of the two fishes tied together by their tail, which is Pisces, is we're swimming in the amniotic fluid and we're connected to our mother by this fallopian tube through which we breathe and receive nutrients. So the whole idea of Pisces really represents your mother's main weight gain is, is water weight, meaning the water that fills up the uterus, the uterine canals and so on. And also at that time we begin forming often because Pisces is very much about psychic connections, about dreams. Your mother may have dreams about the coming child, but also it indicates a very strong, the nature of the psychic connection between you and your mother. The 12th house archetypally represents that there's a, a communication between the two through that fallopian tube. And that's the symbol of Pisces and astrology in general, meaning it represents, for example, 
Pisces in terms of relationships is a symbiotic relationship where you have a partner who resonates with you, who reflects you, who has a similar psychic connection, and so on. Now, this is all very interesting when you begin to when you begin to look around the chart like this, you'll see something very interesting here. I wanted to show you this image. This shows the ninth house, which is Sagittarius, which is what it governs in medical astrology. And I've written a book called Astrology and the Art of Healing. Is the ninth house in, in astrology re representing Sagittarius is also about medically the brain and central nervous system. It's about higher mind, long journeys. It's the long journey of the sperm to the egg and the fertilized ovum through the fallopian tube into the uterus. The nature of that journey is the quality of your ninth house and the planets there and the signs there, as, as well as representing religion and psychology. And that's, again, from conception to seven weeks. The 10th house Capricorn is all about the spine and the skeletal system because it's, it's an earth sign. And of course, Capricorn ruled by Saturn governs bones. It governs our skeletal system in general. And you can see actually that this goatfish image in a weird way looks exactly like the nature of our spinal column, which kind of snakes down around our, our back end and so on. And so Capricorn, the 11th house or 10th house is about spine or skeletal system. It's also about career, fame, success. It's about the time when your mother begins once she realizes she's pregnant, she broadcasts it to people around her. So we have this very interesting idea of, of bringing you into the world in the 10th house. The 11th, 11th house Aquarius is all about, you can see the autonomic nervous system, which is about also, but in astrology, about friends, organizations, plans. Your mother begins to connect up with women that have had children before. She discovers a way of looking, looking at gestation, like it could be Dr. Spock. It could be more recent connections to that. I was very much active when I lived in the UK in the 70s with the active birth movement, ABM. And the active birth movement trained midwives and women to assist in birth itself. And also they began educating women about the birth process in the 11th house of pregnancy. And of course, the 12th house at the very bottom right we see is related to the sign Pisces. And the image is very clear of these two fish connected by their tails, by an umbilical cord. And so the whole idea is I'm thinking that there's some reason why the symbols for these four houses happens to describe stages of gestation. So this is actually a very profound dynamic here. And in fact, we can see really that the whole connection of the chart itself in gestation, the ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th houses, describe the process that happens within your mother. Ninth house being higher mind, your mother begins thinking and feeling and realizing that she's pregnant. She, she accepts the pregnancy on the midheaven. Any aspect of the midheaven will show aspects that are responses to the fact your mother's pregnant. The 10th house could be probably when she contacts your father for the first time. So very often the 10th house is associated with father and the fourth house with mother. The 11th house is when your mother begins to, in the middle stage of gestation, she begins to feel you inside and begins to recognize that there's a being in her that comes from her and yet parallels her path. And again, the 12th house, she begins gaining water weight, she begins becoming more and more vulnerable. In fact, women often isolate themselves in that last stage of gestation from 23 to 40 weeks. You know, they're less active. They be more, they're more careful of diet and things, hygiene, things like that. And then of course, the birth moment is the ascendant. So in my system in lifetime astrology, this is very, very important because it's a transition from the womb, which is within your mother, to your childhood octave from birth until about seven years old, which is the end of childhood, according to most psychologists. So the idea here is that at birth, the sign and the ascendant shows the nature of your birth. 
If it's Aries, it means you push yourself out. If it's Taurus, it means it's a, a purely material operation. It's like we're, ta we're taking a body out of another body. If it's Gemini, it often means there's a lot of communication going around at birth. In Cancer, it also indicates a classic mother. It may be a lot of midwives around. It may be that the mother's mother is there and so on. And, and so on. So the planets around the ascendant show qualifications of the birth process itself. Like, for example, it could easily be um, like Neptune or the moon on the ascendant often represents the idea of an aesthetic at birth. It means increased sensitivity of the child. It means you often maybe tend to be sensitive to drugs or to alcohol. But it also represents just a bodily sensitivity. Or say Mars almost always represents a doctor, a, a cis in the birth itself. Meaning that in terms of your personality, because these are all aspects of your persona, it means that as a personality with Neptune, it means you're very airy, maybe. It, you're very fa you're fantasizing. You're very spiritual. With, with Aries, it often means that you need others to really assist you to be yourself. Pluto is an even more radical uh, uh, version than, than Mars, which often represents C-section or a radical operation happening in the birth moment. It also means that the person is likely to be in their personality, a transformer, meaning they want to they want to radically shift things and change values and so on. Venus on the ascendant may be a lot of focus on way, the way you look. It also could be obviously a signal for a female child rather than Mars, a male child. Obviously the gender of the, of the rising sign the fire and air signs are often masculine personalities. The water and earth signs are often feminine personalities and so on. So again, the whole idea here of lifetime astrology is that where the planets occur in your chart tell you events that happen at certain stages of your life. So a lot of planets in gestation means not, not only do you not come into the world as a blank canvas or an empty canvas at birth, but you come into the world with a lot of information that comes from your mother and your father and their relationship. Like, for example, if you were born with a full moon, it often means your mother and father at the time you were conceived and born were opposite each other. And that often means the kind of relationship you would tend to attract in your life is you're going to attract opposites. The dynamic here really is very, very critical in these early stages because we carry them with us for our entire life. In fact, you could say that the gestation octave from conception to birth is the time during which we create, create our physical body. So in the gestation period in these four houses, we're likely to see influences that come out in the course of our lifetime, physically, physiologically, and medically. We'll see when you talk about brain injuries or spinal issues that happen during, you know, or become aware of at birth and so on, or respiratory issues, Aquarius, or circulation issues, Pisces. That if you see difficult planets in these four signs, it often indicates it affects that bodily system. So if, if the gestation period is your creation of your physical body, the childhood time, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer. Aries is your self-assertion, meaning you're often breastfed for the first seven months. It's very close contact with your mother. You're asserting yourself to exist within the world in Aries. It's also very isolating because it's only until the cusp of the second house at seven months old, you begin the sign Taurus, which is crawling, taking solid food, becoming aware of the physical world around you. This is a prototype. The first house is a prototype of your ability to assert yourself in the world. The second house, Taurus, is your ability to deal with property, finances, material things, and things of this sort. The third house, Gemini, we begin talking at around a year and nine months old until three years and 10 months old. It's also about brothers and sisters, siblings, you know, Gemini is about reflective relationships. We, we reflect who's around us during that period of time. 
we learn how to communicate, we start talking, we start walking. You know, with Aries in the third house, it may mean a child who begins trying to walk out the front door when they're two, two years old. They want to get up and leave as soon as they possibly can. And then the fourth house, of course, from three years and 10 months old to seven years old, represents the family and the home. And that's becoming aware of your relationship of your parents. It's like I often think that in Gemini, we reflect everyone in our family system like mother to child, father to child, sister to child, and so on. In the sign cancer from four, four to seven years old, we begin to realize that we have a relationship to our mother and a relationship to our father, but our mother and father have a third relationship that excludes us. It creates a triangulation, which is, I think, natural to the Cancerian quality or Cancerian persona. So the whole idea is I see the childhood time from birth until seven years old as the time of childhood of creating an emotional body, which we call personality. And so these are likely to be emotional patterns in the same way that in gestation, they're physical or physiological patterns. And again, at around seven years old, we start going out to school. We start stepping out in, into, play, into a game playing relationship with others. Leo's about exterior self exteriorization, which is we go outside of the family and beginning, begin being exposed by different values, different systems of being. You know, again, the, the seventh house, the fifth house is the time from seven to 13, which is just up until puberty. So this is how we begin to learn the games of the world that we live in, the games of our society. And in fact, Leo is game playing, and I can say that being a Leo's son myself. So the idea here is we begin, we begin playing with the world. We begin experiencing our creativity. Virgo begins the puberty. This is the octave of maturity, which is creating, if this is a physical body, an emotional body, this is creating a mental body. And that primarily begins happening in the sign Virgo, which is ruled by Mercury, of course. And this is the time of, second, of high school, secondary school, college, if we go to college. We begin being more critical, more decisive. We begin distilling our life experiences down into particular ways of being. We begin deciding what we want to do with our lives, our career, profession. Seventh house from 23 and a half. That's directly opposite the ascendant. So from birth until 23, we're in the unconscious lower half of the chart, which has to do with the fact that I jokingly say to clients, the time from birth until 23, we don't get to vote really. We don't get to determine our direction in life. We need to negotiate this with our parents. So at around 23, we begin becoming objective and conscious. The seventh house from 23 to 42 is the time of relationships, of partnerships, marriage, children. We go out into the world. We create a career, a profession. And then around 42 and a half years old is kind of midlife crisis, the beginning of the eighth house, Scorpio. So in the same way we developed all of our senses in the second house in Taurus, we begin to lose all our senses in, Tor in Scorpio, in the eighth house. You know, our hearing gets more problematic, our sight begins to weaken, and we begin to leave the world, basically, in the same way that Taurus was when we began to come into our sensory world. In Scorpio, we begin to lose those senses. In the same way that Aries, we created ourselves in our relationships, we essentially give ourselves away. We, we connect it to someone else and to a, a, a larger pattern of programming in the world. So you can see that through the course of the process of, of the, the, the eighth houses up to, to the Scorpio time, it's very clear where planets register show periods of time when your life went through major developments. Like planets in the eighth house may mean that you, you're a late developer. Maybe you start writing books when you're in your 30s and 40s, as I did. I've had the most creative time of my life in the eighth house after my 40s, which is now almost 40 years ago. 
So the whole idea is that we're really looking at the chart as being a pattern of your entire life and time. What's interesting about it is that this begins changing. In fact, because and this is this leads to the whole principle of what's called epigenetics, which is that, and this is a quote from Dr. Bruce Lipton that you might have heard about, which is that it was believed during molecular biology's invention that our genes control our health and destiny. And the idea being is that epigenetic science reveals that you are an extension of your environment meaning your DNA changes in response to environmental signals, including thoughts, emotions, diet, lifestyle, and your belief system, as far back as when you were in the womb of your mother. So throughout this entire process, we're affected by how we believe, how we think, how we act, how we eat, how we contact the environment, and so on. So the whole idea, which is central to lifetime astrology, is that you've got to know the territory in order to be able to make the correct decisions. And lifetime astrology, to me, is really one of the best ways of being able to understand this. So in fact, it's a very curious kind of process here because it starts with conjunction. You know, In fact, the conjunction is very interesting because if you know Carl Jung's work in psychology, his last book was called Mysterium Conjunctionis, which is the mystery, mystery of the conjunction. The conjunction being the contact between the king and the queen, which is your father and mother. And in an astrological context, the king is the sun, the queen is the moon. And the idea here is this, that, that at conjunction, Jung believes that conjunction is not only your own conception at the very beginning of process, but it also represents a transition occurring at the end of that life process. So the whole idea here is the timing in terms of lifetime astrology is very curious because it, it represents the idea that as we reach that conception point at the top of the chart, which is up here, the conception and death point is the same place. So in fact, what occurs in old age, and this is archetypally around my current age, which is around 80, archetypally the conception point, we can also go past that point. And what happens is very interesting is that at some stage in life, you can experience what Jung called the conjunctio, which is the male and female energies in you merge and combine and they integrate. And if you do that, it, it's like a higher level conception occurring within you. And I call it transcendence, or it's creating what uh, psychologists call a transcendental, transcendent or transpersonal octave level. So I believe that there's a higher level of the events of gestation that are capable to be experienced during the life process. Now, in terms of timing, it's very interesting because you'll notice that the time I'm using, the time sense I'm using is not additive meaning the first year in your life is not the same perceptually as the second year or the fourth year or the fifth year. In fact, Ospensky, Colin, and, and, and Gurdjieff all accepted the idea of a logarithmic progression, which is uh, uh, the idea that as we age, our time sense changes dramatically. I look at, I look at all of you and I think that you're not youngsters anymore. And the whole idea here is this, that the conception period, the first stage of life, the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th houses is 10 lunar months, which is the time from conception to birth, nine calendar months. The time from conception to seven years old, creating a personality at the, at the fifth cusp is 100 lunar months, which is 2,800 days or seven years. And a whole lifetime is a thousand lunar months, which is 77 years, which was my age two years ago. And it's 28,000 days. The idea is that each octave occupies the same amount of information. But what happens as we get older is time sense accelerates. Time moves faster and faster and faster 
I jokingly say in talks such of this, I still think of the 80s as being recently. And I'm sure many of you in, this, in my audience would feel the same way. Doesn't it feel like it was yesterday when you were 25? Well, it might not, but the point is that our whole time sense in relation to lifetime astrology is that as we age, our time scale moves faster and faster. Can you see this diagram? This is the first few months in gestation. This is like seven years during childhood. But look at this, it starts going 10 year, 15 years old around, the, around the, the sixth cusp, 25 years old around the seventh cusp, 40 years old around the eighth cusp, and 77 years old at the ninth cusp. So the idea here is that as we age, things move faster and faster and faster, and it also becomes denser and denser and denser. Now, in your chart, I actually, I don't know whether Graham passed it on to you, but I will post it on your website. Basically, I have a diagram that shows not only this time scale and dates the particular times during which the transitions from house to house happen, but on the back of that sheet is a little disc like the one you see right here around the middle of this chart. You see it's a piece of plastic. You can go to your local reproduction center and have a, a, a plastic model made of this. And the idea basically is when you lay this over a chart, this is zero is, is the birth moment. You can see this is five years old is somehow in the fourth house, 10 years old is very close to the cusp of the sixth house. And you can date the planets in your chart based on when they register in your life. You know, again, in this case, you see a ton of planets in gestation. These influences are very interesting because they represent your higher being. In fact, what, what your mother goes through during the process of creating you in the process of gestation, for me, is a mirror of your creative life. Meaning the idea of conception, the ninth cusp, however you were conceived, the planet, you know, the sign and planet on that cusp and so on, tells us about the way in which you came into being, how the male and female part of you integrated. And that shows how that comes together on a higher level. The, the ninth house is about your, what you believe, your psychology, your philosophy, which is extending your reality beyond your physical lifetime. The 10th house is what you do in the world. It's like your, uh, what you leave as a legacy in the way of books or writing or you know, children or grandchildren and so on. Again, the 11th house represents organizations that you are a part of, like maybe you know, Aquarius Severn and so on. The 12th house represents how you deal with emptiness. You know, with the end of life process, you know, it's a very important concept in Tibetan Buddhism. So the whole idea here is that we go through a life process, but it's accelerating as we move through it. So I'll show you a couple of examples just to show how this would work for some charts. So this is one I like to use simply because it's obviously simplified because I took out all the planets except Uranus, Venus, Saturn, and Jupiter. What I wanted to show is how you would look at an event like Venus in Pisces that is dated at around 16 years old for this individual. Okay, so Venus in Pisces, and again, I'm going to go through a process I would go through if I were doing a reading, and you're astrologers, you're likely to be able to come up with similar conclusions. First of all, what, what is someone likely to be doing at 16 years old? They're around the time when they're thinking about, pr they're probably still in high school and thinking about college. So, so again, so what kind of things would this particular person be interested in with Pisces in this house? Aquarius and Pisces, they're very idealistic. But again, Pisces is being very creative. It's being very receptive to creative channels. It might be an, with Venus there, it might be an interest in music or, or art. In fact, what happened at this point is that this individual began thinking about going to art school at this particular time, you know, which is very natural at 16, 17 years old. So what I would do then next is I wanna see, I wanna see what's the earliest influence going back in the chart. So this is maturity. 
this is their childhood with Jupiter in the second house. But I want to go all the way back to this trine between Venus, which is also as a young woman's chart, by the way. Venus trine the midheaven in the sign Cancer indicates the following. She was being warned by her mother at this particular point that if you're so attractive, and she was, you've got to be careful not to get pregnant. Because guess what? She, in fact, was conceived when her mother was 16 years old. So this already is a repetition of her mother's chart, meaning the trine backwards from Venus all the way back to the, to the midheaven, which is in the gestation octave, which is the time when her mother realized that she was pregnant with her. There's another trine over here, which is down to Jupiter and Scorpio in the second house. She was visited by an uncle at this time who was very generous. And she sat on his lap and he bounced her around. She was very cute at two years old. He gave her a kind of wrist, you know, a pocket watch to play with. And she played with it for a while. But then when he left, he took it back from her and walked away. So what does Venus and Jupiter in the second house, I mean, Jupiter and in in Scorpio in the second house, is that she's drawn to people who are very generous, but who want to take things back in the end. She actually met a professor around this time when she was six, 17 years old, who was very generous to her and offered her all kinds of advantages at school, except he wanted some kind of sexual connection to her, which is again, a Venus-Jupiter contact. She was she was paying attention to what her mother warned her about, which is to not be too easily seduced at that time. Also, Venus we see is in square to Saturn. She was, when she was very little, when she was learning to talk, Saturn and Sagittarius means that her grandmother actually spoke Yiddish, believe it or not. She was born and raised in New York City. And so when she was learning to talk, she actually picked up more language in Yiddish than she did in English. So the whole idea was she began having trouble with her language. She began having trouble communicating to other people in her life at around this time. Saturn being an older teacher, she had a teacher at her school who was a foreign person, and she had all kinds of tension with him in this relationship. So the seventh house means that in terms of career, she's drawn to very positive people who really know you know, what she's going to do and, and offer her advantages. But there's also like a side issue, which is it's difficult for her to really jump up and to really recognize and understand this new direction. Also, we see Venus has this sextile to Uranus, which is curious because that represents an aspect ahead into her 50s. So really the key to this story is a fascinating one, which is that I did a reading for this person when this woman was in her 50s. And the whole idea, of course, was that at 50 years old, she was a teacher. And what kind of school do you think she would have been a teacher in? An art school, right? Which is the connection between Uranus and Venus. She also, Uranus is in an aspect again to Saturn, which is a quincunx. And that indicates a, a, a difficult issue, which is that she's older, but she's around a lot of younger students. And it also is directly opposite to Jupiter and Scorpio, which is she, she ends up being very generous to students around her. And it's very, very interesting because what happened is she had a relationship with a younger female student at around this time, which led to all kinds of difficulties with Uranus in the eighth house. So do you see this little story tells us a lot about a person's lifetime? And not only it tells us about her past, but it tells us what to look forward to in her future and about where to go, where to go moving forward in her life. This is basically a part of in, in, in Windstar, which I think Graham has. You can have a, a list of lifetime events which are called sensitive points. They're all of the aspect points of the planets in your chart, and, and they're all dated in terms of month and year. And it also tells you what age you are when these happen. You can basically track events in your lifetime using this whole method of lifetime astrology. It's also standard in Sirius, 
It's also in a program called Astro Gold, which is a relatively new one. You know, for example, the idea of mythology is very common in astrology. And Joseph Campbell once stated that myth is a manifestation of symbolic images, metaphorical images of the energies of the organs in your body. This organ wants this, that organ wants that. The brain is one of those organs. Lying beneath even the unconscious, collective or personal, is the body and constantly of the urgency of its needs, which are the generators of myth and a guarantor, so to speak, of identity and authority. I don't know if you're aware of, you know, in, in the UK, when I was living there back in the 70s and 80s, there was a predominance of psychological astrology and they, they treated it as though you were a psyche with no body. Lifetime astrology is quite unique before, because the nature of your physical body is incredibly essential. And it's, a, it's, a, it's basically how we go through life and so on. And so it's an active major part of who we are. Again, this just shows briefly, again, an image like this is in a book of mine called A New Vision of Astrology that's a more recent version of the round art. So basically all of the organ systems and all of the glands in our body are related to planets. And we can understand where our weaknesses are likely to be. Like I have Sun and Leo, I had a square Mars, I had open heart surgery 18 months ago. Classic in terms of the connection of Leo and the heart, Mars being about surgery and so on. This is a page from Eberton, which I think is a very useful interpretation source, particularly because not only does it have psychological dynamics of the signs, and their aspects, but it also has biological correspondences, meaning it shows you what different planetary combinations create in terms of your physical organism, because they parallel each other. In terms of things like cancer or heart disease or any medical afflictions always can be found through this kind of useful source of Everton. You know, I love the idea of healing zones, you know, that aspects in the chart penetrate deeper levels to the center of your being. So you can see an opposition goes right through the middle of the chart, like a square goes into the middle of your being. You can see it goes from urine, from Mercury all the way into the middle of your being, and then it, it takes a right angle turn back out to Jupiter. So a square goes into the middle of you, and, and then it forces you to change direction. So a square planet coming up in your life shows a time when you're forced to change direct, direction. A trine, a trine indicates, again, the idea of penetrating only halfway into the center. So a trine between you and someone else is great, except it means they're only going to allow you halfway in, and you're going to only allow them halfway in, and so on. So I use this little image as a way of seeing how deeply aspects manage and register. Again, the way these aspects work is they work like something called a strange attractor, which is about, about a symbol in chaos theory, which is that, that things move from, like if you have a Venus-Saturn aspect in your chart, you vacillate between being very Venusian and the, the Saturn becomes less and less critical, and then suddenly it begins to shift back to Saturn, and the Saturn becomes more critical structure, dynamic, things of that sort. Uh, and, and then it gradually shifts back towards that Saturnine side where Venus becomes less important and so on. They're, the aspects are continually fluctuating from one end to the other and so on. You know, this is a virgin conception, you know, and what I do when I start looking at a chart is I look at the conception point, which is up here, the ninth cusp, you can see Mercury's right on the ninth cusp. This often means that the father, which is the son next to the son, had to convince the mother that they should make love in the first place. So what I do first is I look at the conception point and I go back to the luminary that we come to first, which in this case was Moon and Scorpio conjunct Neptune. What do you think that would mean leading up to a conception? It could mean the mother was intoxicated, which in fact was partially the case here, but also this was actually her first sexual encounter ever. It was a virgin conception. 
you know, Neptune being very virginal, it's being very simplistic in a way. And so you go back to Moon in the eighth house means the mother, Moon and, Moon and Scorpio to boot, which is that she doesn't really want to have children. And, but this comes about anyway. So the idea is for this individual, when they eventually grow up, they end up feeling a bit rootless in terms of connection to mother. And again, you can see the sun registers in the just, you know, in the ninth house around the time when the mother went from becoming pregnant, oops, from becoming pregnant to actually realizing that she was pregnant. We see sun and Mars in Sagittarius. The father was imagining he was somewhere else. In fact, it turns out that this individual whose chart this is, is like a war zone photographer who is in the Ukraine at this very moment. You know, he's a young man who searches for situations where people are in distress to photograph them, to send things back to his society. And that's part of his belief. So this is really a very powerful kind of dynamic to really look at the influences leading up to the gestation octave. Remember when I said that the time from the death point, which is the eighth cusp, actually is up here. If you look at the chart, basically the gestation octave is before it. If you imagine that the chart's sitting on a table like this, Think of it as a cylinder stepping up into the air. And so as you age, you go from the ninth cusp around the cylinder to the birth moment, and then up the near side of the cylinder to the fifth cusp, to the descendant, to the eighth cusp, ninth cusp here, which is the death point. So you can see as you age, the cylinder fills up with, with layers of memories. And the cur your current age in the cylinder is the surface of what that cylinder contains. So the idea of psychotherapy, you reach down into the cylinder and pull up memories close to the surface. But in lifetime astrology, you can describe what happens throughout that whole cylinder. And if you have a transcendent experience, which can be a psychedelic experience, it can be utilizing ayahuasca, it can be through psychotherapy, through spirituality, through meditation, you can gain access to this higher octave, which is the higher level of the influences of gestation. <clears throat> I call it a transcendent level. And it's like the physical body of gestation, the emotional body of childhood, the mental body of maturity, and the spiritual body of transcendent. And this is really, to me, something you can imagine this, trans, this spiral of DNA traveling up the middle of that cylinder because that's basically our life process in time. You know, you can look at and see different things in charts in a very powerful way. This, for example, was during the gestation of this woman. When I did a reading for her, I noticed that moon conjunct node in Scorpio in the 11th house. And this is about 10 weeks after she was conceived. What I think happened basically because it's opposite to Saturn, you know, and, and also in a quincunx to the sun, is that it indicated an attempted abortion on the part of her mother and her grandmother. And it turned out, obviously, she was born through this whole process, but she was a very beautiful and very attractive woman that I met in England when she was in her 20s. And the last thing she wanted was to have children and didn't know why. And it was because of this earlier event in her chart and she began to realize immediately that it was her mother and her grandmother who lived in asia at this time who really were worried about her health and basically the birth happened anyway even though they attempted to abort her and so this was basically what changed her attitude towards the idea of having children herself so you discover keys in people's lives that are really quite crucial to their emotional health, their psychological health, and so on. So the first talk I ever gave in the UK uh, in, in the late 70s was, the title of it was, Was Winston Churchill Illegitimate? And I thought, and actually it was directly opposite the Houses of Parliament in that massive cathedral. And it was very interesting because around this time, 
it was like the 100th anniversary in 1974 of Churchill's 100th anniversary of his birth. The point is his birth weight was never given then. It turned out actually that Churchill was seen as being, or was it announced at the time he was born as being two months premature. And again, you can't quite see in this chart, but the idea here is that if you date the midheaven in Churchill's chart, which was when his mother realized she was pregnant with him, it actually occurred two months before Churchill and his wife got married. So in fact, he would have been a, a two month premature child. However, his birth weight was announced in 1974 and the birth weight was something like eight pounds and 12 ounces. So he was a gigantic baby and he wasn't obviously premature at all. And I use this as a validation for the fact that Lord Randolph and Jenny Jerome conceived him before they were married, which is a very interesting idea to kind of put across in terms of the UK. So I'm gonna go through the rest of the examples I gave which I'm not gonna have a chance to do. But the whole idea is that... We keep visualizing and this. we teach this in schools to all the children that the solar system has the sun in the middle and planets going in circles around it like this. And we, I mean, in my school, we even had a little device where you had the sun in the middle and you could turn the little uh, thing on the bottom and, and the planets would go around. and you know is this true no absolutely not in fact thinking of the solar system this way is equivalent to thinking the earth is flat uh, the sun is moving at thousands of miles per second through space and our planets are following producing a huge elliptical coil in space and year after year we do not trace the the same uh, circle in space we're actually thousands and thousands and millions of miles from where we were the year before. So to think of our solar system as some flat structure that's, uh, that's stationary is again the result of isolating a system and trying to analyze it. And, and typically when you do so, you get the wrong data. As soon as you open the system and you realize the solar system is inside the galaxy and moving through space, then you realize that actually we're making a pilgrimage, literally, through space as we evolve and you could even think of it in the concept of a of a vacuum structure that we are embedding all of our evolution on the structure of the vacuum as we move through that great spiral we're producing through space every single individual on our planet producing that very specific spiral in space and we could follow it back for any individual all the, back, all the way back when to when they were in the womb of their mother which connects their spiral with their mother's spiral and then follow that back and again and again and again and that is the continuity of the information inside the gene the gene structure of our evolution through space and now we we get a much more complete view of the structure of the mechanics of our evolution.